Ouais. Ouais. Ouais, mais je trouvais ça, je trouvais ça rigolo quand même. Ouais, ouais voilà, pour faire Warframe. Il y a un terme en fait Oui, il n'y en a pas, mais c'était pour la blague. Je ne sais jamais dans les autres, dans les autres langues d'écrire des animaux. Oui, c'est vrai. Ok. Just to know there is a free Wi-Fi, a Movistar free Wi-Fi that is accessible. So just uh, for international people that don't have data here. And for Spanish too. Comme à l'entracte des matchs de basket, tu sais. <rire> ah bah Mais sur, sur, sur les trucs, quand on voulait faire des trucs marrants comme ça, tu sais, faire, faire des entractes, faire de la vie et tout, à un moment donné, on était parti dans un gros trip. Ouais, t'as rien. Thank you. 
ton lit, t'es dérangé. I hope you checked all your emails. <laughs> so because we will host, we will uh, uh, have Jan, so please Jan, come on the stage. So Jan from Paymill, some, some applause for Jan. <laughs> we'll talk about web as a framework. So I'm looking forward about the content. So Jan, please. Well, well hi everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Jan as maybe already told you. Um, I work for a company called Paymill as a developer evangelist. So Paymill is basically a company allowing people building websites to accept online payments. But I'm not here to tell you about payment, which is not such an exciting subject. Receiving money is exciting, but implementing it not always. But um, I'm gonna tell you about uh, one of my past jobs, like when I went out of school, I was working as a CTO for a small startup in Paris. Um, yeah, and that was great. Like we were like building really cool software, and I was like in charge of driving my small team of interns and and building this product. It was very great. I wanted to do everything. Like we were having this old computer in the corner of the office for 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 using it as a server and hosting the application, and we were building every single piece of, uh, of the app. That was great, the good old days. But that was awful practices, and along the way, I learned all the mistakes I made, and I understood why it was so bad. Uh, the company still exists, but it was a miracle, because launching a startup this way is really a waste of money and time, and that's very harsh. So. What were these bad practices and what most of people do when they start a company? At least they did back in time. I hope you're not doing this in your own company. But I, 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 before starting, I bet what I just said is just uh, reminding some of you of similar experience. Who had a similar experience? Don't be shy. Raise your hand. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> we all did this. So the, f the first thing is like we tend to build monolithic big apps. So when we start a project, we pick up our favorite framework, be it Ruby on Rails, like uh, I, I don't know, like Symfony, if we do PHP, like Spring for Java, whatever. And we start building our application, like we know how to do it with the framework and throw everything at it. And your application basically is just a huge single block of code. And at some point, yeah, it's just like maintaining it becomes quite harsh. Um, and, and yeah, it's very hard to, to get out of this big monolithic app. Uh, I think one of the most well-known examples of that is Twitter. Like they had a huge rail application and now what, what they are trying, still trying to do today is what they call getting out of the monorail. And it's just like modularizing their application and for, 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 sustainable, for sustaining the growth. The other mistake is wanted to be in charge of everything. Like when I was in my team, we were like, okay, yeah, we were gonna take care of the database, the servers, like implementing everything, the authentication for our users. Like we, we almost built a, a Java framework. Like we didn't because we were using Flash with Flex and, and, and uh, and Java as a backend server, but if we could have been writing the JVM ourselves, we would have been doing it. And we were juniors, engineers, so to say, so we were obviously absolutely not capable of doing it. But we wanted to do it. So yeah, very bad practice too. And when you do this, you end up having more and more people in your team working on that project, and you have a huge, huge team working on a big project, and that leads to problems. So what happens when everybody's working on, uh, on the same 
on the same big project and you have a lot of people like not talking to each other, uh, you can end up in this kind of situation. If something breaks in the middle, the rest is screwed. Like everybody, everything breaks. So pretty dangerous. But yeah, we were still, okay, that's fine. We can do it. Like, yeah, tomorrow the, the, the service will be ready. We can do it. And it was taking more and more and more time just to build the product. And that was so awful. And what happens someday, everything breaks. <laughs> and most of the time, this is the, the end of your good startup. Just because you, you wanted to build everything, be in control, you just had a great idea, but you wasted it, and you lost all of your money and your time and your investors and whatever, and that's a shame. So the question is, can we do better? Um, I know you're really eager to have the answer, so I give it to you now. Yes, we can. So for example, like, just think about this huge team working on a big project, it's very complicated, like, like we said. Couldn't we just have smaller bits in a project with smaller teams working on it? So if you have, like, if you split your teams, like, splitting a project is easy, like, you don't have to work on a big monolith monolithic project, you can just split it in different concerns and have uh, smaller teams working on each part of the project, so it's a lot easier to manage a single team for a single bit of the project rather than managing huge teams for a huge projects. So if you compare this and this, would you rather eat that big burger? Okay, sometimes I do because it's still funny, but afterwards I'm, I'm sick for, for the next day. But it's more pleasurable to eat all those small bits rather than a big one. And the advantage is your teams can be real experts in each area they're working on. So instead of trying to have like uh, multi-purpose teams, you can have ex team experts at databases, experts uh, at mm, UI, uh, etc. And in the end, it leads to more, efficient, more efficiency and uh, greater quality. So. Communication. Some people sometimes are worried that if they have like all those small pieces of software split and communicating together, they s it will be hard just, okay, if we change something, uh, will it break the whole system? The thing is, you just have to maintain common communication channels, what we call APIs actually, and if your API is consistent between the parts of your system. It doesn't matter what the team is doing. They, can, they could be like rewrite everything in another language. The other team could still use their part of the, the, the software because the, the, the interface remains the same. Like for example, if I give you my phone number, I won't. <laughs> but if I were to give you my phone number, you could call me if I have an Android phone, and if tomorrow I change my phone and I have, have an iPhone, you can still call me with the same number, right? So it just doesn't matter like how a part of the system is implemented. If the API is consistent, everybody can still use it and, and work all together. A company organization. So in a company, Traditionally, you have like business units, like a unit taking care of the marketing, unit taking care of the sales, you have, uh, you have the, the C-level management, you have the IT, whatever. And you, you, you don't have employees doing everything. You don't have people like coding in the morning, like doing accountancy in the afternoon and, and doing customer support on the evening. You don't have that, so why would you have teams working on all aspects of your project, why would you have a huge piece of software taking care of everything? Think of an, a company organization and just split the concerns and, and ma make everything interact like business units in a company. So 
If you do this, in the end, you, you, you end up with an application which is split between a lot of small services interacting all together with small teams working all together. But can we push it a bit further? What we do today is most of the time we won't have those small teams in, in our own company. We will start using uh, third party services provided by, by other companies. And this is what we most of the time call um, web uh, oriented architecture and what I call the web as a framework because the acronym you can make with it is really funny, like WAF, like the sound that dogs make in France. I don't know what sound dogs make in Spain, but so WAF, that's cool. So why these practices are emerging now? Uh, I remember like when I started with my first company, there were words like, uh, dre dreadful words like SOAP, web services, WSDL, contract first, whatever, and it was like so awful to hear that I didn't want to try it, so web services was a no-go for me and for most people. And someday we had REST, so REST is not new, REST is not even a technology, you all know what REST is, of course, I hope. So it, it was, uh, it, was uh, it started in 2000 actually, but it was widely used uh, lately, in late 2000s. And what it made, it, it made easy to use API and to build APIs. And so that's why we had a huge adoption at some point. And this allowed people to outsource specialized module. I don't know if you heard about this, uh, this project, like the phone block. Li like a phone manufacturer would build only a uh, kind of a motherboard. And then third party providers of the company could provide like a module for the battery, a module for the camera, a module for, for the GPS, anything you can think of. And you could swap all of these modules and change a module from a provider by a module from another provider. Now with, with API providers, it's exactly the same. Like you can build your product using third party APIs and assemble them all together and swap for another provider at some point if you're not happy of, or if you need to change. The good advantage of this, it allows you to be focused on your business. When you're building a product, when you're starting a new project, if you start a new company, you don't have much money, you don't have much time, and you have sometimes investors asking for results and you need to deliver your product to, to your customers and make them happy. If you do like I did in my first company, you will never succeed because you, don't, you can't be an expert at everything. You can't hire expert people for everything and you can't be with your small team the expert at everything. So be focused on your business. If you're building a payment solution, for example, you will have enough uh, work like dealing with the banks and everything so you won't want to to take care of the database and and everything so you just focus on the the area where you add real value and for the rest you can rely on on third party apis so sometimes people tell me yeah but it's very expensive to use all of these services that's not necessarily true because most of the time those services offer a free or a cheap tier for low usage. And when you start a product, uh, I don't think you will have a million users from day one. And if you do, you're so lucky that it's not a, a concern for you anymore. But if you don't, you don't need to have like the big plans like 1,000 euros per month for, for starting. You can just start small and then grow. If you have users and if your business plan is, is correct, usually if your business model I mean is correct, usually you won't have problem to get money from your users. So you can then afford all of these services and resist the temptation to build those pieces yourself someday because even if you get the money, still paying for, for, for those services can be valuable because in the long run maintaining everything 
costs a lot more money. So you have a real return on investment, like outsourcing parts of your application to, to specialized people that really know what they are doing. I'm going to show you like different kind of APIs. So I, I identify three kinds of API. Uh, you might disagree with me. We can discuss it after the talk. But the three kinds I identified is first what I called machine interface to user-centric product. What this means is you had products like Facebook and Twitter that were built for being used by people through a UI. Like you go to the website, you, you do things, you post messages and whatever. And then that's the product. But then they built an API so all the services, all the application could use the same functionalities too. So basically for these services, the API is just an alternative to the UI for the machines. The second kind of API is automated product interactions which means the API is still not the main product, but it allows you to interact with the product. For example, if we take Amazon uh, Web Services or Dropbox, you can use their API to, provi to, to provision new instances or, or to, to store files directly in, in, into, into your Dropbox for this kind of thing. So the, the, the service is something else like computing power, storage space, or whatever. But the API allows you to use it directly from your own application. So this is a joke, a private joke, but today it won't work. And the third kind is, <laughs> sorry, API as a product. So API as a product is when your API is the product it, it itself. So we, we saw context IO just before me, and um, for us, PayMill, what we do, we provide a payment solution. You integrate with your API directly, and that, that's what, we, we don't have a product aside. Like, we have a UI, so you can, you can check your stats and everything in the back office, but it's not the main product. The main product is the API you, we provide for you to, to process your payments in your, in your payments workflow. So this is API as a product. I, I think that's mainly what Ellie has been talking about this morning. So we'll, we'll see a few useful APIs. First, what I would call mandatory APIs. Why mandatory? Because those things, you really can't build them yourself. If you try to build those things yourself, like, <laughs> you're crazy. Or you want to start another service like that, which is completely valid. But if you're not an expert in this field, if, you're not, if it's not your main focus, don't try to build this kind of product. For example, for payments, you could use Stripe, or if you want to do it properly, another service. <laughs> because you have to deal with banks, so you have to, to be present in every country for, 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 for taking care of the differences in banking systems. That, that's, that's a, a huge hassle. So. Let specialized people do it and focus on your product still. Emailing, it's easy. Yeah, I just installed a Postfix server or whatever and I can send emails. Don't do it. Really, don't do it. It's, it's the, the biggest trap. Like, it seems very easy to, to take care of emails yourself, but you will have like emails going to spam for your customers. It will take like years for you to fix that. You have, you'll never understand why some of your customers don't receive the mail or whatever, so use an emailing service for that. It's really worth the money. So I put MailJet, you obviously have SendGrid, uh, MailChimp, and a ton of other ones. And another example is for voice APIs or, uh, or messaging APIs. If you want to, to interact um, via voice and, and phone with an application, like building this is really hard too for, for many reasons. So use a service like Twilio. There are other useful APIs, but I would say they are optional, not because they are not good products, they're awesome products, but you can still build this yourself. Like for example, we have OHOS.io, which is, uh, you, I think everybody here knows what it is. 
I hope so, which is uh, authentication as a service with OAuth. And you could be build this yourself. But it's still better, like, like for the reason we said, it's still better to use another service because that's not your, your, your job. StormPass is the same for user management. And if at some point you find that you miss a brick in your architecture that no one is providing a service for, for, for your application, you can build this service for completing your, your architecture and then if you build it aside like a small module, like I said before, like split your application, don't do monolithic application. So if you build just this small piece of the service you miss for your application, you can sell it as an API. That's a nice byproduct. By and then there is sense to maintain it and whatever because you have other users taking use of it. And so that's a that's nice byproduct. The, the, the question I get most is, yeah, that's great, but how do I integrate third-party APIs in my product? If I have everything in-house, I know how to make all those pieces communicating, but if I have pieces outside, how does this work? And the question, the, the answer is really simple, like you have scripts pulling the servers all the time to know is there are new answers? No, you don't. You have what we call webhooks. And a webhook, most of the API implement that, is a way for the API to call an endpoint on your own server to notify you when, when something happens. So I have a quick demo to show you. Okay, yes. Okay, so I built a very useful API. Uh, I, I, I will put it online and you, you could all use it because that's so awesome. Like when you, you pass a string to this API, it will answer something like your string is being watified. What happens? I built, for, for, for showing you really what happens, I built a really an awesome application if I can find it. Where is it? Yeah. Okay, I built on top of this API a really cool application called Dawatifier. So if I type hello Barcelona, I see that it tells me that your string is being watified. If I refresh, it's still nothing changed. So what happens? If I go here, I see that at some point, I have my server here telling me doing what, which means it did something. And if I refresh, the string changed here. So what happened? Like I simulated like a delay in the, in the response of the API, a 10 seconds delay. And so you can't have your, your, your interface block for your user waiting for an answer from the API. For example, if you process the payment, sometimes the bank won't answer straight on. So we will just say, okay, your, your payment request is, is being processed, and then you can just, it's not blocking, you, you just release uh, the interface. And then when the payment is processed, the API will call, will, will call your own service and, say, and tell you, okay, the payment was successful or, or the payment has been refused, but you didn't have to wait for that. That's exactly what happened when I, when I just, try to watchify a sentence. The API send an answer, your string is being watchified, and my system will be notified once it's ready. And that's why if I refresh, suddenly the change has been made. So I didn't have to pull the API myself to get the answer. The API contacted my, my service directly. So, yeah, to, to, uh, to wrap up everything, I would say that now when we are building an application, it's more a matter of assembling third-party services all together, 
Most of the time you will build only a small pieces, really the core of your service, where you add value and the rest is adding third party services. So it's kind of doing a puzzle, assembling everything to have a great product. Um, this is the way to use the web as you would, uh, you would use uh, any other framework for, for your language of, of, of choice. So that's all I have for you guys today, but if you have questions, We have time for a few questions. Actually, I have one small. Why did you choose uh, Jigsaw Puzzle instead of Lego Bricks for your last uh, web as a framework? No, is there any? That, that's a good question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, I don't know. Yeah, Lego Bricks makes sense. Maybe I, I, I change this slide. And, and just when you say web as a framework, how do you manage uh, which API you will choose or not? So what is the opportunity to say, okay, this mail API, okay, maybe I will use it or not? So what is your vision? You, you said you was a bad CTO, not bad, but good developer, but bad CTO. And uh, yes, but uh, now you, you may be good, but what would be your mindset to say, okay, uh, this, okay, for this we will use an API, no, for this we will do it internally. Yeah, I, I think I think it's like when when, when you, you pick up a framework for, for your language of choice, it's it's just you, you, you don't know straight on, okay, this one is good, this one is not good. You have to do comparison just to to try to read if the, the advice of other people. And and sometimes if if a brick for, for me I would I would always use uh, an API as I would always use a framework for building a, a brick of my application. If at some point I, I can figure out that this this uh, framework or, or API doesn't work for this particular situation, at this point I can think about rewriting it myself, because it will be a point where my application is already working with users, bringing money, so I can afford doing this. So I, I would never try to to implement something that already exists upfront. Choosing the right one is uh, is a matter of just trying to gather advices and it's not uh, there's no scientific method for me for choosing a product no. okay one question there um, when you split your application in little components do you think that it's a good idea to communicate it over a rest protocol or maybe it's, it's better to use a low-level message passing protocol yeah, once again, it really depends on what your what your application is is doing and and the way you host all those components. Uh, communicating via REST uh, is is one solution. If you want to have something uh, close to real time and very efficient, you can use like messaging queues, like RabbitMQ, these kind of things, which is uh, which is most of the time used for communicating between different pieces. Yeah, it, it really depends. If you if you really think your your, your architecture like uh, an, um, a group of APIs interacting together and it's more or less web style oriented and doesn't require like real time performances, I, I think it's better to go with REST because uh, at some point, if you want to expose uh, your API to to other users on the web, it would be easier to do so. So depends on 